But I said, especially because we've got a, a smaller number of us. Um, yeah, please participate. Let's make this a, yeah, very much a, a discussion rather than a, a one-way thing. So our um, kind of regular format for these is we go through kind of a, a win of the month, which is, you know, um, uh, celebrate people's achievements. Um, today I learned, which can be either either uh, yeah, uh, celebrate our failures or, you know, um, uh, talk about you know, things that we've discovered. And, and this can include you know, things that we've uh, uh, come across and, and, you know, read and learned, as well as uh, yeah, things that we've tried that have proved more challenging than we expected and that are you know, good, good tips for the rest of our user community. Um, a few announcements and calls for participation. Uh, then we'll spend sort of you know 15 minutes going through our, our topic of the day. And uh, for this month, uh, it's currently nearing the end of the SC20 conference. And so we'll make that our uh, topic we'll uh, talk about, or yeah, showcase a, a little bit of uh, NERSC's involvement in that. And then a bit of uh, preparation for upcoming meetings and a quick look at our numbers for the last month. So the idea of the win of the month uh, segment is uh, this is an opportunity to you know, show off an achievement or shout out someone else's achievement that you know about, uh, such as you know, having a paper accepted, uh, accepted um, you know, uh, something as you know, seemingly um, you know, small scale as solving a bug that you know, you'd been working out for a while that was proving challenging, and, you know, especially if there was some uh, you know, good tips and lessons for the rest of us there. Um, scientific achievements. Um, this is also a you know, good uh, uh, opportunity and avenue for um, science highlights or um, you know, science uh, uh, high impact scientific achievement awards or also innovative Innovative Use of High Performance Computing Awards, which uh, NERSC uh, awards each year. Uh, does anybody have anything that they'd like to either nominate, self-nominate or um, shout out somebody else for? Well, uh, this is Koichi from PNL. Uh, can you Hi, hear you me? Can. Hey. Nice yes, speak. we can. Yes. Yeah, we had a paper uh, accepted, actually already published uh, earlier this month or maybe last month, but I, I forgot to prepare the information at the hand. <laughs> but uh, maybe uh, next good. month, uh, maybe show a figure or something, but that's totally uh, based on the simulations we run on the NERSC machine. Yep. That's uh, climate model simulations, but with relatively new uh, model or more like experimental, so th uh, such that uh, it's global model, but we can refine the grid spacing or spatial resolutions over a certain region of the world. So, uh, for this paper, we use three simulations or maybe two, uh, three simulations. Uh, for example, it's globally uniform. Uh, 200 kilometer grid spacing outside the world, but only only over the U.S. we refine the grid spacing to, for example, 25 kilometer uh, grid spacing, which is getting close to the scales for close to the resolution we can resolve those intense large uh, convective storms and. Particularly important is the we were studying this particular kind of storm, which called mesoscale convective systems. That's really uh, leads to many flooding event over the U.S. About sixty percent or fifty percent of the uh, uh, annual precipitation is are coming from this storm. So, using those simulations around NASC, and then we also developed an uh, algorithm again around on NASC to automatically detect and track those uh, mesoscale complex system, both in observations and the simulation. So this paper is actually a technical paper that we describe the technique we use to track those storms in the simulations and compared to observations and uh, how the model is doing. 
Uh, so I, I believe this is going to be a maybe you know really useful one to the community, and uh, hopefully it's going to be uh, cited. And we did we did acknowledge uh, NASC on this paper. So yeah, uh, nice so work. That, uh, yeah, thank you. So so yeah, twenty five um, kilometers would be yeah. So so I guess that's the um, yeah like large storms. Does that capture hurricanes? They start to doing that, even Started though, to capture yeah, too. some, you know, still there is some differences in the maximum wind speed, for example, but uh, yeah. yeah, because it start to really dissolve hurricanes, uh, actually, uh, the next phase of, you know, IPCC's climate warming report, uh, there's a bunch of us around the world contributing climate simulations to for their scientific basis. And then this time, yep. so this phase, this is gonna be a sixth uh, climate report. We, uh, international communities, including the particular model archive that is specialized in higher resolution global models. And that grid spacing is actually around this 25 to 30 kilometer. Yep. And then people and uh, people are already started, uh, you know, looking at some of those model outputs that's already available, and then uh, try to study how the hurricane is going to be changed in in the warming uh, future after fifty years or hundred years later, based on those a bunch of, you know, higher resolution global simulations and. I yep. am actually running these simulations and asked for Steve and asked us to <laughs> actually. Uh, to better uh, manage workflow and then make it reproducible and sustainable. And uh, sometime maybe next year, I, I wish I can uh, demonstrate how useful those model outputs are uh, in this uh, monthly meeting. That's right. Yeah, we were talking about um, uh, building the model in a in a container, perhaps to keep it yes. um, sort of stable version and so on over over a long yeah. period of time. That that should be quite yeah. an interesting project. Yeah. I, uh, I think I'm really excited. It's uh, and then because those simulations are climate scale, you know, hundred years, it takes a uh, real, you know, really couple of years to finish. So, yeah, I'm really looking forward to this containerization of our model executable. Yeah, and this is um, so. So I think we were talking about the CSM model for that, yes. which is a which is a fairly complex model, um, is. which which is what makes it kind of an interesting challenge compared to yeah. um, containerizing a, uh, you know, a lot of other applications. Um, yes. So was the, um, the the mesh refinement system, was that um, built into CSM as well? Or was it a, a standalone separate model? Uh, I'm sorry, could you say that again, the question? The, um, yeah. the mesh refinement system oh, yeah. that, that the paper was about, was that also built on, on CSM? Uh, not yet. Actually, the work is ongoing now. Uh, so they are really working on bringing this particular model component as a official part of the released version of CSM, maybe next version. So yep. we are kind of a guinea pig on running those models in the existing CSM. What kind of uh, you know complications or, or problems we might encounter? And we did a couple of um, uh issues in running this model even with higher resolution down to four kilometer yep. this at this resolution i am seeing some memory scaling uh problems so uh right now i cannot run continuously this four kilometer high resolution uh simulations uh on nasc coli or other systems at the uh, National Center for Atom Atmospheric Research. But yep. interestingly, before we had this major updates several years ago, uh, before SRAM system, we are using something different, right? Um, yep. At that uh, time, yeah, I, I forgot the main vendor. Probably AP run, maybe. Yeah, and at that time, with MPI available, MPI library available at that time, we did not have this memory problem, but once we change, then we suddenly start to get in this uh, more memory problem. And it's coming maybe from some MPI subroutine, it just gets uh, frozen. 
exchanging some data. And okay. I just didn't have a chance to open the ticket for this, but uh, maybe in the near future, I might uh, try to you know, more work closely with you guys to solve this problem. Then that gives us really exciting research venue, you know, going down to four kilometers really makes model much more reliable to predict those uh, storms. Yeah, sounds good. Um, yeah, I reckon for, for debugging that we'll um, you know, take take that into a ticket that should be a yeah one that we uh, dive into. And um, yeah, great work. And, and four kilometers, you'd be able to um, resolve individual thunderstorms, I guess. Yes, it's getting so, that, yes. Yeah. Cool. Um, good, thank you. Yeah, thanks, Gucci. Um, so uh, I had reports from um, another of our users, uh, Dilip Asligiri. I'm, I'm not entirely sure if I'm pronouncing his uh, surname correctly, um, but uh, had a paper just recently published in Journal of Physi uh, Physical Chemistry Letters that uh, is a, a fairly significant finding around uh, protein folding and showing the influence that temperature has on protein folding. So, um, there was a press release around that, uh, but a lot of that work was done using uh, NERSC systems as well. So uh, shout out to Dilip on that uh, work. We've got a, a link to the press release in the article here as well. Um, does anyone else have a, a story to uh, tell us about? If not, we'll go on to the next thing in our um, agenda, which is sort of the other side of it. Um, today I learned what surprised you that it might benefit other users to hear about, you know, and, and uh, along the way might help nurse to, you know, improve our, our documentation, for instance, or, you know, make, make tweaks that can uh, you know, make our system easier to use. I have to say this week or this last couple of weeks, I have not spent a lot of time uh, bug hunting, for instance, because uh, I've been fairly occupied with the supercomputing conference, which we'll talk about in a little bit, but there was definitely a, a lot of interesting things to learn there. Um, admittedly, I don't know how public, there, there's a YouTube channel um, that I suspect a lot of uh, talks will appear on. Uh, so again, this is Koichi again. Yep. <laughs> I'm kind of uh, keep keep uh, uh, sorry, bothering, but uh, yeah, it's yeah, um, great. So like I, we just briefly discussed, we are starting to work on using you know shifter for yep. our climate model. So first, I learned uh, this month I seriously, more seriously, you know, uh, took some tutorial about what is really image and containers. And then yep. when, went through shifters documentation, which is uh, very nice because they have several examples that, uh, but uh, again, it's just more like uh, suggestions or maybe in the future, uh, including my, you know, our own maybe you know, potential work, but uh, just the application for now, main application is probably the Python, I guess, for the shifter, is that correct? Um, uh, Shifter is is particularly good for Python things, um, and particularly at scale because of uh, if you have some of the I guess um, gotchas with using Python and um, oh, dynamic libraries. It's, okay. it's dynamic loading at scale that then yeah Shifter solves a lot of those. Okay, yeah, I'm thinking to use maybe in the future, you know, when I need to scale my Python application, and particularly if we have to share that, you know. When we publish a paper, we have to account for some reproducibility issues. So um, yep. this is a really good, uh, really good, I think, in terms of that, how to share the methodology I used and so that other people can reproduce the results. And uh, for documentation itself, sometimes I find some part of the documentation is rather difficult to understand. So I quite uh, you know, needed to 
quite a few Google search and then uh, go through some other technical you know, uh, articles. So um, I wonder if there is any places I can put questions or comments for particular part of documentation. Like this um, paragraph is not too, too clear or does this mean this or maybe you can edit this this yes. way. Um, so, so actually the nurse uh, docs pages are a public GitLab or you know, come from a, a public GitLab repo. Mm -hmm. um, so you can, um, in fact, you can make merge requests against it. So, oh, okay. so you know, you can uh, add to its improvements as well. Uh, I do so have I the link down, here somewhere. So I just need to download this uh, Git uh, repository on my somewhere local machine and then just push the change or suggest. Um, yeah, basically, you can um, make a make a merge request or uh, open an mm -hmm. issue even. So okay. up here, there's a oh. link to the GitLab okay. site. Uh, I was going to ask when you were talking about doing tutorials, um, which tutorials were you following? And I guess, did you find them helpful? And if so, can can you uh, point us at them? It might be good Actually, for other users too. I, I think I just follow the link from the NASC documentation. They recommend uh, okay. uh, tutorials of a Docker somewhere. So I followed that and the Docker website has a bunch of uh, nice tutorials, including which YouTube videos and uh, the other is this is my surprise but uh, there's already uh, you know Docker image of CSM uh, model in a simplified configuration uh -huh. so I, I kind of use that uh, that is uh, you know publicly available from the National Center for Atomic Research that they use that uh, Docker image of this complex kind of models uh, for for tutorial for the students, and yeah. uh, that's also helped me to really get the you know understanding of uh, you know, Docker image and container. Even though I'm still really debating how people use the term containers and image. Right. So the con container is just one uh, you know realization or instance of an image. But that's not I, the, how people generally use these terms. Does not really sounds like it. Do you, Do you have any? Do you know have any? Um, like so some, somebody else on the call might have better experience than than me at this. But I've always taken the um, understanding that the image is the thing that's on you know on the on the registry or on Docker Hub or something like that. And the mm -hmm. container is the running instance of it. So, okay, okay. so Shifter yeah, runs yeah. the container. Okay. Uh, it's possible that somebody else here can correct me on that. Okay. That makes sense. Okay, so that's a that's a, a good tip that Inkar has a, a good tutorial. Yeah, they did I didn't know that then. Uh, I was really surprised about this Docker image of this complex model. Hmm. <laughs> Yeah, that sounds like a, a good place to start. Um, cool, thanks, Koji. Um, time for our next um, item, which is announcements and CFPs. So uh, there's a, a few things that we know of that are or that are um, published in the um, nurse weekly email that I'll just uh, shout out to. One is you should see in your inbox this week sometime an invitation from a company called NBRI on behalf of NERSC for your feedback. This is our annual NERSC user survey and um, it's, it's really important for us both in terms of our reporting and keeping, uh, you know, uh, what do you call it? Uh, discovering how we can improve our services to users. So uh, please follow that when you see the link. Um, you probably noticed there was a maintenance yesterday. Corey was out, uh, of course it's back again now. 
the maintenance was, was I think, mostly fairly minor from a user-facing point of view. The PE defaults are still the same as what they were, but if you were using the old 20.03, you'll find that that's no longer there, but you can use the new PE uh, uh, CDT, sorry, CREPE um, 20.10, but neither of those are defaults. You need to uh, you know, do a, a module load to access either, or to access that. Um, we have some upcoming training events at the beginning of December. So between December 8 and 10, there are training events for NVIDIA's HPC uh, software development kit and also for the TotalView HPC debugging tool. Um, so yeah, that, that will probably be very useful for anybody who's trying to do debugging at scale. Um, big one coming up in December. There is the final power upgrade in preparation for install, installing Perlmutter. And that's going to happen in the week of uh, December 15 to 20. So in particular, we're expecting power to be out between Tuesday the 15th and Friday the 18th of December. Uh, and so that will affect all of NERSC, not just Cori, everything, file systems, HPSS, networks. Um, yeah, we'll, have, we'll have no power in the building. So keep watching the weekly emails for updates on that. Um, but yeah, be, be prepared for a, a outage during that time. Um, we're coming close to the end of 2020 and there are a couple of changes happening in 2021. Uh, a particularly important one is changing the way that the premium queue is used. Uh, Lisa, do you want to expand on this? Um, sure, I can. Um, so we we have a, a staff committee that meets to assess sort of the, the queue and whether it's meeting users' needs. Um, and one of the things we wanted to do was to reassess um, how premium was used so that it's really just used purely for a scientific type emergency um, where you have something like an unexpected scientific event like a supernova or maybe something happens in your detector and you really need to, to push your jobs through, um, that would be something that you would you would try and use premium for. Um, you know, you have a review and you need, um, you need the results from that review right away, something like that. Um, we did find that some repos were using, tended to use premium at the end of the year um, just to kind of use up their hours. Um, and we don't think that's really how we think it should be used. It should be available to all users for urgent scientific um, scientific needs. Um, so starting next year with the new AWA year, um, we're going to change the way that projects can use premium. Um, so normally the charge factor is times two. Um, and so folks will continue to be able to use premium at a, a charge factor of times two um, until they spent 20% of their total allocation uh, on premium jobs. And then after that, the charge will increase to times four. Um, and we, we may reserve the right to change this um, increase in response to how premium is being used. Um, and one of the other features that we're adding for this is that um, PIs will be able to go into IRIS and um, select whether or not users in their projects will have access to premium because sometimes people you know, accidentally use premium or use more than they intend. Um, so now this will be something that the PIs can toggle on and off. Um, and we'll have instructions on the web page on how to do this. By default, all the users won't have access to premium. So you'll need to, if you're a PI, you'll need to go in and turn on. If you want to give someone access, you'll need to go in there and, and click a couple buttons. Cool. Thanks, That's Lisa. That, uh, I think will be very handy for uh, a lot of PIs in, in managing their allocation. Um, we also have a new Jupiter kernel, uh, a, a new Julia kernel for Jupiter and uh, Johans, I think you know details of this one. Yeah, so um, we've added support for uh, Julia uh, to our Jupiter hub. Um, so if you go to jupiter.nest.gov now, um, you will see the Julia uh, kernel uh, appear in the list of possible uh, kernels to choose from. Um, I've sort of highlighted with the arrows here. Um, so these will be uh, officially supported kernels by us, um, and they will live alongside your, um, if, if you have any of your own local kernels installed, um, 
they will live, live alongside those. Um, the um, uh, quote unquote official kernels have the additional advantage that they will um, uh, give access to the uh, Julia packages that we support um, at NERSC alongside your uh, packages that you have uh, installed locally. Um, this, uh, this is a new feature, so um, I am looking for people to kick the tires. Um, so for example, some, uh, some bits in, in Cori GPU are still experimental, such as uh, MPI. And so if you uh, um, have a chance to play with this and uh, find out uh, anything that doesn't work, uh, or if you have any requests, please let me know. Um, and uh, I'd be really happy to hear uh, about what, what your perspective is. Thank you very much. Oh, uh, one, one, one uh, final thing. Uh, I, um, we sometimes see uh, the kernel takes a little bit of time to start up. Um, so I'm just going to uh, encourage people to be a little patient with that. This is the standard Julia problem. Uh, sometimes uh, the kernel, it has to pre-compile some packages. Uh, and so um, if it looks like it's stuck uh, during the connecting phase, um, uh, give it a moment. Uh, that might just be it pre-compiling stuff. All right, so that's it. Cool, thanks, Johan. So, and and that kernel can see packages in .julia. So if you do package, uh, package.add, yeah, some so package, um, it will appear in that kernel as well. Yeah, so the way we set it up is um, we have um, a um, sort of a commonly supported packages uh, list uh, that we've installed for Cori. Um, and that contains things like MPI that need to be configured for, for our systems. Um, and then when a, a user uh, goes and says package add, I don't know, let's say distributions or something, uh, that will then land in their um, .julia folder, right? So, so Julia sees the union of our package list and whatever the user has uh, um, installed uh, for their local system, like for in their local environment. Sounds good, thank you. Um, so that's all of the announcements that I knew about. Are there any others that uh, people would like to make that I didn't know about? <laughs> So if not, then so for our uh, topic of the day this week, so this, this week and last week have been the um, Supercomputing Conference SC20, so also, also known as the International Conference for High Performance Computing, Networking, Storage, and Analysis. It's, uh, um, what do you call it? The domain grows every year, it seems. Um, but yeah, that's uh, it's quite a major conference for HPC. And NERSC has been quite involved, and I suspect a lot of NERSC users have also been involved. Um, you know, most of our users, of course, will be working on, you know, science that's in you know, a specific science domain. Not, you know, you know, people are using computational science to achieve, um, you know, research and outcomes in other fields. Whereas this conference focuses on the computational aspects of the computational science itself. So I thought it'd be good to just do a quick run through of um, some of the things that uh, happen in the conference and what NERSC's involvement is it, uh, in it is and uh, NERSC users. So um, also very interested to hear, um, you know, from our users, uh, if you've been involved in anything that you've uh, done. So by way of overview, this is sort of what the web page looks like. Um, uh, Google search will find it pretty quickly. This year being, you know, COVID affected, where uh, it's a uh, virtual conference and it's spread over two weeks instead of the usual one week. So, and it's, it's got quite a wide 
um, you know, range of materials, tutorials, workshops, um, uh, events for students, social things, and uh, you know, papers and, and panels. So one um, fairly big aspect of it is tutorials um, in the first week, and these are uh, quiet, you know, deep dive intensive sessions that are you know, a, a full, a, either a half day or a full day. Um, and nurse staff and nurse users were involved in a number of these. So uh, uh, performance tuning with the roofline model, um, uh, visualization and in, in situ analysis, parallel IO, OpenMP, deep learning, UPC++, containers, so I think that was all of the tutorials that I knew that um, NERSC and NERSC users were presenting. So that's it. It's uh, quite a few. Uh, there's also a lot of workshops happened um, in the first week of the conference this, this year. And NERSC staff and users were involved in quite a lot of those as well. And I suspect that I haven't even caught the ball here. So there's the Women in HPC workshop. Um, this year, there was the first international workshop on quantum computing software, and some NERSC as well as other LBL people were involved in sort of organizing and presenting at that. There was the uh, deep learning on supercomputers workshop. Um, HUST is the international workshop on HPC user support tools. So that's one that uh, NERSC is sort of directly uh, involved in. Um, there was the uh, SE workshop on best practices for HPC training and education. There was a workshop on workflows for large scale science, a workshop on containers for HPC. There was the parallel data systems workshop, um, workshop on performance modeling, benchmarking and simulation, workshop on accelerator programming, uh, interactive high performance computing, uh, you know, such as uh, Jupyter. Um, machine learning and experiment in the loop computing, which is um, computing or, or supercomputing for you know, large scientific facilities, you know, things like accelerators and, and telescopes. So I guess the, um, the, the message here is that, you know, there's a, a lot going on and particularly, you know, NERSC and NERSC users are involved in a whole lot of different aspects of uh, or, or usage uses of HPC as well as development of it um, out of interest. Was anybody yet something that I missed here? So as well as the workshops, there was uh, the main paper session and that's been happening this week kind of in the, in the technical program. Um, I sort of captured a few papers that NERSC staff and NERSC users were involved in uh, from the main paper section. I haven't captured the ones from the workshops. I suspect there's even more of those. But so there was uh, some that NERSC staff were involved in. Uh, some of them are kind of domain science, such as the ones that you can see on the on the right hand side of the page here. Um, and some of them are you know, computational science and HPC management, such as the ones on the left. Um, some NERSC staff were involved in a Gordon Bell effort that is a finalist and the award ceremony actually happens immediately after this meeting starting at uh, 12 Pacific time and we'll find out who won that one. NERSC users presented even more papers. So there was a, you know, a number of papers that uh, I saw at least bits of that used NERSC systems. across sort of a, a mixture of, um, sort of yeah, computing and the domain sciences. Uh, I spotted NERSC staff names on at least three posters, and I suspect that there's more from NERSC users that I didn't see. Um, there's a, a fairly big uh, students at supercomputing program, and one aspect of that that so actually NERSC was involved in a number of aspects of the students program. This is kind of important for bringing up, you know, uh, fostering new talent in HPC and in computational science. And, and one aspect that um, 
yeah. <laughs> is is dear to my heart that, that I was involved in was um, we hold a or well, there is a uh, student cluster competition that this year was entirely virtual so everybody was building clusters in Azure and running a set of benchmarks and applications and so in fact one of the applications that the students had to build and you know, run some tasks for uh, was in fact uh, CESM. Um, so yeah, reproducibility challenges and other other applications and activities. So this is a a, a dashboard that kind of helped to keep things yeah, exciting when you're in the yeah the the, the somewhat more distant um, virtual environment compared to physical. Um, but you know, being able to see the teams you know burning their cloud dollars and using CPU time and getting results in. Um, you know, was was quite engaging. Oh, excuse me, Steve. Yeah. Um, what did you say? What was the application that used for this student competition? So each year, there's uh, two or three applications. Mm -hmm. um, there's, or generally, there's two applications that are announced in advance. One application that's only announced at the competition, so it's a, a mystery application, and one reproducibility challenge. So our two applications um, that were announced in advance this year were Gromax and CESM. Really? So okay. the students had to build and run uh, a number of um, tasks on each of those. The mystery mm -hmm. application was one called Minivite, which is a, uh, I believe it's a graph analytics program uh, application. I haven't sort of looked too closely at it. And the reproducibility challenge was um, from a paper from last year called MemXCT, which is a, um, a memory oriented or memory optimized um, uh, X ray tomography reconstruction. Okay. Um, they, they use some fairly clever techniques to uh, run at very high scale. And so the students uh, attempted to reproduce some of the experiments that that paper published. Okay, good, interesting, thank you. Yeah, so actually one of the things that has been a, a bit of a topic of interest for a little while now is this whole idea of reproducibility and uh, SC papers are now, they were encouraged, I think they might now be required to submit with the paper um, artifacts to uh, enable reproducing the research. Mm -hmm. So yeah, that's a kind of an increasingly important aspect of computational science. Nice um, there was a, a bunch of also um, uh, birds of a feather session panels. Um, Ness was also involved in a number of the committees helping to organize and run the conference. And a number of um, NERSC staff, especially I think some of our networking and security people were um, instrumental in SciNet, which is the supercomputing network, which is a, a, a fairly major effort to you know, enable kind of yeah, high speed networking to support, you know, especially the exhibit floor, as well as all of the um, connections that are being used by, you know, 10 or 15,000 people at the conference. So I guess my key sort of take home here is um, that NERSC is really involved in the development of HPC as a field. So I, you know, for, for our users, NERSC is kind of a, a facility that provides resources and you know, uh, hopefully helpful um, you know, interactions with, with uh, you know, HPC support and so on you know, to enable uh, DOE uh, researchers to, uh, you know, to to make great discoveries and you know support the work that you all are doing um but yeah i also wanted to kind of uh show off a little bit that NERSC is also really actively involved in the development of hpc of you know, computational techniques of you know, how to better run a high performance computing system and you know the the future directions for it to go um and and actually our users are are a pretty important part of this because you know the the 
needs and interesting ideas that you all come up with um, kind of, you know, help us help you know, motivate our um, you know, directions that we try to push HPC in. And then in turn in kind of a, a virtuous cycle, um, the outcomes that nurse users achieve uh, yeah, come back around to the uh, funding and support from government that you know enables NERSC and, and similar facilities to keep on going. So thank you all. Um, which kind of leads into, or actually maybe before before leading into that. Um, uh, so I, I see in the participant list, there's a, a number of nurse people here who were probably at the conference. I don't know if uh, any of our users were there, but does anybody want to shout out any other you know, particular sessions or involvements that you saw or were involved in? Bit of uh, <laughs> silence there. That's that's all good. Um, so this kind of spills into uh, our next uh, agenda thing, which we've sort of skipped through pretty quickly in the last couple of these meetings because we've uh, you know, had a, you know, a somewhat involved um, topics of the day, um, which is requests and suggestions for upcoming topics, and so. Um, in a way, so what we just did here was a, a showcase of yeah, something that NERSC has done. And we're pretty interested actually in hearing also from our users about your work and how you're using NERSC facilities and you know what you're finding works for you, what's challenging and how you're overcoming those challenges. And just you know, uh, a bit of a you know, showcase the research that you're doing and the outcomes that you're getting. So yeah, we're very interested in topics for future meetings and I'd like to really encourage um, our users to you know, put a hand up and um, yeah, present maybe a, a five minute lightning talk on you know, what you're doing and uh, yeah, show off uh, what you're achieving. Other than that, um, so we have a, a few ideas for topics coming up, such as more about Slurm uh, in, a, in a conversation the other week, somebody was talking about the HPSS move and you know, that's probably another quite interesting um, you know, story to tell. But I'm interested to hear if uh, people here have any other uh, topics that they'd like to nominate or request as a topic of the day for these meetings. Steve, I think I have one a couple of uh, ideas yep. or questions uh, I want to discuss in this uh, monthly meeting. One is the uh, what is the best practice or a good template for users to open a ticket? Like when yep. a user open a ticket, what kind of information should be or is is better to be there in the first time so that you know NASC help desk can more easily understand situation yeah and then so that's you know so how to describe the problem and also um i sometimes get wonder how can i tell how much i know about the problem to the help desk as well or more in general I'd like to know if there's any general idea of level of the user's expertise in HPC. Like, you know, we have many users, many different backgrounds, I believe, at the NERSC. And are there any general idea of from NASC side to some assumptions or assumption about maybe users know this much or maybe they should know some you know 
of course, I assume most of the users know basically in the Unix, for example, Linux. But uh, some uh, students may be first time to, to even use uh, HPC. So some people might abuse in login nodes, for example. Uh, so one time I feel, sometimes I feel this when I read in documentation, uh, documentation explains something well above my uh, knowledge base. Right. So that, that's one uh, another aspect of, uh, so, so first we have to know probably what is the, you know, average knowledge of the users, but which also difficult to quantify. So really I don't have a good idea to measure this, but at least from uh, the coming back to the first point, it's, uh, I think nice to know, nice to share with the users, what information would be helpful if we, when we open a ticket. And so I do yeah. want, want to it's discuss a... that with other users and not ask uh, stuff. Yeah, I think that would be a, a good topic. Actually, um, might be a good one to target in the early part of the year um, when we when we have uh, you know, a whole lot of new users coming on. I think something right. that we've seen over the years is that the um, the NERSC's user base has expanded from a you know, a smaller number of kind of your know, relatively highly experienced people uh, in HPC to a much wider range of people who have come from very different backgrounds and may not have had as much experience in HPC. So, um, yeah, um, something that yeah. you may have already seen that we kind of hope will make this a little bit easier is the new service portal. Um, at the moment, oh, yeah, yeah. I believe it's still in, in beta, but if you add uh, SP to the end of the web address, you can see that. Okay, yeah, I, I think I tried. I'm opening ticket from the new uh, interface these days. Uh, I, I like it quite uh -huh. a lot, yes. It's, it's uh, really nice. Good to, good to hear. Yeah. Uh, but uh, just one more um, comment about the, you know, the, the users. Uh, I noted uh, many students using, in, at least in my field, yep. because current models are so nicely configured for out of box, uh, you know, simulations. Yeah, you can run pretty much simulation, particularly in a computer system that is supported by CSM, for example, without knowing much about HPCC our HPC yep. system. So once they start doing something else, that there's some you know learning curve and then some potential to make some problems. So yep. yeah, uh, these some you know schools are uh, students are better educated compared to for example my generation, but some are maybe even less educated in this uh, because they don't really need to know about any building software, you know you know, what is make, CMake, that's that's what we have to start. And then even though, yep. don't know those, you know, flags for the compilers and they, they, they don't know about those as well. Anyway. Yeah. So that, that's yeah. interesting. That might be um, good for us to take into account with our uh, new user training. Mm -hmm. But perhaps uh, there, there needs to be a, a little bit of Maybe as an background optional. training. Yeah, background optional background training might be um, yeah good even helpful for, for PI if, if those new members mm -hmm. don't cause problems. Yeah, yeah. Great, hey, thank you. Cool, thank you. It's a, a helpful idea. Um, so we're getting close to the end of our um, time. We have one last thing on the agenda. Oh, and um, if others have got um, topic uh, requests or would like to, you know, nominate to present something, um, post it, post it in the Slack webinars, I think is a, a good place to discuss. Uh, so uh, finally for this week, um, quick look at last month's numbers. So Corey's uh, scheduled availability was uh, Fairly, fairly high actually, all things considered, sort of 96%. Um, 
and we can see the you know, the main unscheduled outage was the kind of the, the remaining time after the uh, you know, rather rather large sea scratch incident that um, we talked about last month. And HPSS and CFS um, uptime was all quite good. Um, core utilization was 91.4% uh, and 28% of jobs um, were over the large job threshold. So that's, um, we have a, a obligation, I guess, or a target to support, you know, 25% or more of our overall workload. We'd like to be, you know, large scale uh, jobs that, you know, can't run on a, on a system that's smaller, pretty much. You know, we, part of our um, mission is to support work that just can't be done anywhere else. So um, our closed tickets slightly exceeded our new tickets in the last month, which has brought our backlog down to a, a little under 600 as of, uh, I think that's a typo, that should be the 1st of November. And that's all I have for today. Thank you all for joining us. Um, we'll post these notes in the webinars channel and on the web page fairly soon. Thank and you. Uh, enjoy the rest of the week. And we'll uh, talk to you all more at the next one.